Happiness The three big ones in life are wealth, health, and happiness. We pursue them in that order, but their importance is reverse. Learning happiness don't take yourself so seriously. You're just a monkey with a plan. Happiness is learned 10 years ago, if you would have asked me how happy I was, I would have dismissed the question. I didn't want to talk about it. On a scale of 1 to 10, I would have said 2 tenths or 3 tenths. Maybe 4 tenths on my best days. But I did not value being happy. Today, I am a 9 tenths. And yes, having money helps, but it's actually a very small piece of it. Most of it comes from learning over the years my own happiness is the most important thing to me, and I've cultivated it with a lot of techniques. 10 Maybe happiness is not something you inherit or even choose, but a highly personal skill that can be learned, like fitness or nutrition. Happiness is a very evolving thing, I think, like all the great questions. When you're a little kid, you go to your mom and ask, what happens when we die? Is there a Santa Claus? Is there a God? Should I be happy? Who should I marry? Those kinds of things. There are no glib answers because no answers apply to everybody. These kinds of questions ultimately do have answers, but they have personal answers. The answer that works for me is going to be nonsense to you, and vice versa. Whatever happiness means to me, it means something different to you. I think it's very important to explore what these definitions are. For some people I know, it's a flow state. For some people, it's satisfaction. For some people, it's a feeling of contentment. My definition keeps evolving. The answer I would have given you a year ago will be different than what I tell you now. Today, I believe happiness is really a default state. Happiness is there when you remove the sense of something missing in your life. We are highly judgmental survival and replication machines. We constantly walk around thinking, I need this, or I need that, trapped in the web of desires. Happiness is the state when nothing is missing. When nothing is missing, your mind shuts down and stops running into the past or future to regret something or to plan something. In that absence, for a moment, you have internal silence. When you have internal silence, then you are content, and you are happy. Feel free to disagree. Again, it's different for everybody. People mistakenly believe happiness is just about positive thoughts and positive actions. The more I've read, the more I've learned, and the more I've experienced, because I verify this for myself, every positive thought essentially holds within it a negative thought. It is a contrast to something negative. The Tao Te Ching says this more articulately than I ever could, but it's all duality and polarity. If I say I'm happy, that means I was sad at some point. If I say he's attractive, then somebody else is unattractive. Every positive thought even has a seed of a negative thought within it and vice versa, which is why a lot of greatness in life comes out of suffering. You have to view the negative before you can aspire to and appreciate the positive. To me, happiness is not about positive thoughts. It's not about negative thoughts. It's about the absence of desire, especially the absence of desire for external things. The fewer desires I can have, the more I can accept the current state of things, the less my mind is moving, because the mind really exists in motion toward the future or the past. The more present I am, the happier and more content I will be. If I latch onto a feeling, if I say, oh, I'm happy now, and I want to stay happy, then I'm going to drop out of that happiness. Now, suddenly, the mind is moving. It's trying to attach to something. It's trying to create a permanent situation out of a temporary situation. Happiness to me is mainly not suffering, not desiring, not thinking too much about the future or the past, really embracing the present moment and the reality of what is, and the way it is. 4. If you ever want to have peace in your life, you have to move beyond good and evil. Nature has no concept of happiness or unhappiness. 
nature follows unbroken mathematical laws and a chain of cause and effect from the Big Bang to now. Everything is perfect exactly the way it is. It is only in our particular minds we are unhappy or not happy, and things are perfect or imperfect because of what we desire. For the world just reflects your own feelings back at you. Reality is neutral. Reality has no judgments. To a tree, there is no concept of right or wrong, good or bad. You're born, you have a whole set of sensory experiences and stimulations, lights, colors, and sounds, and then you die. How you choose to interpret them is up to you, you have that choice. This is what I mean when I say happiness is a choice. If you believe it's a choice, you can start working on it. 77 There are no external forces affecting your emotions as much as it may feel that way. I've also come to believe in the complete and utter insignificance of the self, and I think that helps a lot. For example, if you thought you were the most important thing in the universe, then you would have to bend the entire universe to your will. If you're the most important thing in the universe, then how could it not conform to your desires? If it doesn't conform to your desires, something is wrong. However, if you view yourself as a bacteria or an amoeba or if you view all of your works as riding on water or building castles in the sand, then you have no expectation for how life should actually be. Life is just the way it is. When you accept that, you have no cause to be happy or unhappy. Those things almost don't apply. Happiness is what's there when you remove the sense that something is missing in your life. What you're left with in that neutral state is not neutrality. I think people believe neutrality would be a very bland existence. No, this is the existence little children live. If you look at little children, on balance, they're generally pretty happy because they are really immersed in the environment and the moment, without any thought of how it should be given their personal preferences and desires. I think the neutral state is actually a perfection state. One can be very happy as long as one isn't too caught up in their own head. For our lives are a blink of a firefly in the night. You're just barely here. You have to make the most of every minute, which doesn't mean you chase some stupid desire for your entire life. What it means is every second you have on this planet is very precious, and it's your responsibility to make sure you're happy and interpreting everything in the best possible way. 9. We think of ourselves as XED and the world as malleable, but it's really we who are malleable and the world is largely XED. Can practicing meditation help you accept reality? Yeah. But it's amazing how little it helps. Laughs you can be a long time meditator, but if someone says the wrong thing in the wrong way, you go back to your ego driven self. It's almost like you're lifting one pound weights, but then somebody drops a huge barbell with a stack of plates on your head. It's absolutely better than doing nothing. But when the actual moment of mental or emotional suffering arrives, it's still never easy. 8. Real happiness only comes as a side effect of peace. Most of it is going to come from acceptance, not from changing your external environment. 8. A rational person can end peace by cultivating indifference to things outside of their control. I have lowered my identity. I have lowered the chattering of my mind. I don't care about things that don't really matter. I don't get involved in politics. I don't hang around unhappy people. I really value my time on this earth. I read philosophy. I meditate. I hang around with happy people. And it works. You can very slowly but steadily and methodically improve your happiness baseline, just like you can improve your fitness. 10. Happiness is a choice. Happiness, love, and passion, aren't things you end either choices you make. Happiness is a choice you make and a skill you develop. The mind is just as malleable as the body. We spend so much time and effort trying to change the external world, other people, and our own bodies all while accepting ourselves the way we were programmed in our youths. We accept the voice in our head as the source of all truth. But all of it is malleable, and every day is new. Memory and identity are burdens from the past preventing us from living freely in the present. 3. Happiness requires presence. At any given time, 
when you're walking down the streets, a very small percentage of your brain is focused on the present. The rest is planning the future or regretting the past. This keeps you from having an incredible experience. It's keeping you from seeing the beauty in everything and for being grateful for where you are. You can literally destroy your happiness if you spend all of your time living in delusions of the future. For we crave experiences that will make us be present, but the cravings themselves take us from the present moment. I just don't believe in anything from my past. Anything. No memories. No regrets. No people. No trips. Nothing. A lot of our unhappiness comes from comparing things from the past to the present. For anticipation for our vices pulls us into the future. Eliminating vices makes it easier to be present. There's a great definition I read, enlightenment is the space between your thoughts. It means enlightenment isn't something you achieve after 30 years sitting on a mountaintop. It's something you can achieve moment to moment, and you can be enlightened to a certain percent every single day. 5. What if this life is the paradise we were promised, and we're just squandering it? Happiness requires peace or happiness and purpose interconnected. Happiness is such an overloaded word, I'm not even sure what it means. For me these days, happiness is more about peace than it is about joy. I don't think peace and purpose go together. If it's your internal purpose, the thing you most want to do, then sure, you'll be happy doing it. But an externally inflicted purpose, like society wants me to do X, I am the first son of the first son of this, so I should do Y, or I have this debt or burden I took on, I don't think it will make you happy. I think a lot of us have this low level pervasive feeling of anxiety. If you pay attention to your mind, sometimes you're just running around doing your thing and you're not feeling great, and you notice your mind is chattering and chattering about something. Maybe you can't sit still. There's this nexting thing where you're sitting in one spot thinking about where you should be next. It's always the next thing, then the next thing, the next thing after that, then the next thing after that creating this pervasive anxiety. It's most obvious if you ever just sit down and try and do nothing, nothing. I mean nothing, I mean not read a book, I mean not listen to music, I mean literally just sit down and do nothing. You can't do it, because there's anxiety always trying to make you get up and go, get up and go, get up and go. I think it's important just being aware the anxiety is making you unhappy. The anxiety is just a series of running thoughts. How I combat anxiety, I don't try and fight it, I just notice I'm anxious because of all these thoughts. I try to figure out, would I rather be having this thought right now, or would I rather have my peace? Because as long as I have my thoughts, I can't have my peace. You'll notice when I say happiness, I mean peace. When a lot of people say happiness, they mean joy or bliss, but I'll take peace. To a happy person isn't someone who's happy all the time. It's someone who effortlessly interprets events in such a way that they don't lose their innate peace. Every desire is a chosen unhappiness I think the most common mistake for humanity is believing you're going to be made happy because of some external circumstance. I know that's not original. That's not new. It's fundamental Buddhist wisdom I'm not taking credit for it. I think I really just recognize it on a fundamental level, including in myself. We bought a new car. Now, I'm waiting for the new car to arrive. Of course. Every night, I'm on the forums reading about the car. What? It's a silly object. It's a silly car. It's not going to change my life much or at all. I know the instant the car arrives I won't care about it anymore. The thing is, I'm addicted to the desiring. I'm addicted to the idea of this external thing. Bringing me some kind of happiness and joy, and this is completely delusional. Looking outside yourself for anything is the fundamental delusion. Not to say you shouldn't do things on the outside. You absolutely should. You're a living creature. There are things you do. You locally reverse entropy. That's why you're here. You're meant to do something. 
you are not just meant to lie there in the sand and meditate all day long. You should self-actualize. You should do what you are meant to do. The idea you are going to change something in the outside world, and that is going to bring you the peace, everlasting joy and happiness you deserve, is a fundamental delusion we all suffer from, including me. The mistake over and over and over is to say, oh, I'll be happy when I get that thing, whatever it is. That is the fundamental mistake we all make, 24-7, all day long. For the fundamental delusion, there is something out there that will make me happy and fooled forever. Desire is a contract you make with yourself to be unhappy until you get what you want. I don't think most of us realize that's what it is. I think we go about desiring things all day long and then wonder why we're unhappy. I like to stay aware of it because then I can choose my desires very carefully. I try not to have more than one big desire in my life at any given time, and I also recognize it as the axis of my suffering. I realize the area where I've chosen to be unhappy. 5. Desire is a contract you make with yourself to be unhappy until you get what you want. One thing I've learned recently, it's way more important to perfect your desires than to try to do something you don't 100% desire. 1. When you're young and healthy, you can do more. By doing more, you're actually taking on more and more desires. You don't realize this is slowly destroying your happiness. I find younger people are less happy but more healthy. Older people are more happy but less healthy. When you're young, you have time. You have health, but you have no money. When you're middle-aged, you have money and you have health, but you have no time. When you're old, you have money and you have time, but you have no health. So the trifecta is trying to get all three at once. By the time people realize they have enough money, they've lost their time and their health. Eight success does not earn happiness. Happiness is being saddest with what you have. Success comes from dissatisfaction. Choose. Confucius says you have two lives, and the second one begins when you realize you only have one. When and how did your second life begin? That's a very deep question. Most people who are past a certain age have had this feeling or phenomenon, they've gone through life a certain way and then gotten to a certain stage and had to make some pretty big changes. I'm definitely also in that boat. I struggled for a lot of my life to have certain material and social successes. When I achieved those material and social successes, or at least was beyond a point where they didn't matter as much, I realized the people around me who had achieved similar successes and were on their way to achieving more didn't seem all that happy. In my case, there was definitely hedonic adaptation, I'd very quickly get used to anything. This led me to the conclusion, which seems trite, that happiness is internal. That conclusion set me on a path of working more on my internal self and realizing all real success is internal and has very little to do with external circumstances. One has to do the external thing anyway. We're biologically hardwired. It's glib to say, you can just turn it off. Your own life experience will bring you back to the internal path. 7. The problem with getting good at a game, especially one with big rewards, is you continue playing it long after you should have outgrown it. Survival and replication drive put us on the work treadmill. Hedonic adaptation keeps us there. The trick is knowing when to jump off and play instead. Who do you think of as successful? Most people think of someone as successful when they win a game, whatever game they play themselves. If you're an athlete, you're going to think of a top athlete. If you're in business, you might think Elon Musk. A few years ago, I would have said Steve Jobs, because he was part of the driving force creating something that changed lives for all of humanity. I think Mark Andreessen is successful, not because of his recent incarnation as a venture capitalist, but because of the incredible work he did with Netscape. Satoshi Nakamoto is successful in that he created Bitcoin, which is this incredible technological creation that will have repercussions for decades to come. Of course, Elon Musk, 
because he changed everyone's viewpoint on what is possible with modern technology and entrepreneurship. I consider those creators and commercializers successful. To me, the real winners are the ones who step out of the game entirely, who don't even play the game, who rise above it. Those are the people who have such internal mental and self-control and self-awareness, they need nothing from anybody else. There are a couple of these characters I know in my life. Jersey Gregoric I would consider him successful because he doesn't need anything from anybody. He's at peace, he's healthy, and whether he makes more money or less money compared to the next person has no effect on his mental state. Historically, I would say the legendary Buddha or Krishnamurthy, whose stuff I like reading, they are successful in the sense that they step out of the game entirely. Winning or losing does not matter to them. There's a line from Blaise Pascal I read. Basically, it says, all of man's troubles arise because he cannot sit in a room quietly by himself. If you could just sit for 30 minutes and be happy, you are successful. That is a very powerful place to be, but very few of us get there. 6. I think of happiness as an emergent property of peace. If you're peaceful inside and out, that will eventually result in happiness. But peace is a very hard thing to come by. The irony is the way most of us try to find peace is through war. When you start a business, in a way, you're going to war. When you struggle with your roommates as to who should clean the dishes, you're going to war. You're struggling so you can have some sense of security and peace later. In reality, peace is not a guarantee. It's always flowing. It's always changing. You want to learn the core skill set of flowing with life and accepting it in most cases. 8. You can get almost anything you want out of life, as long as it's one thing and you want it far more than anything else. In my own personal experience, the place I end up the most is wanting to be at peace. Peace is happiness at rest, and happiness is peace in motion. You can convert peace into happiness anytime you want. But peace is what you want most of the time. If you're a peaceful person, anything you do will be a happy activity. Today, the way we think you get peace is by resolving all your external problems. But there are unlimited external problems. The only way to actually get peace on the inside is by giving up this idea of problems. 77 Envy is the enemy of happiness I don't think life is that hard. I think we make it hard. One of the things I'm trying to get rid of is the word should. Whenever the word should creeps up in your mind, it's guilt or social programming. Doing something because you should basically means you don't actually want to do it. It's just making you miserable, so I'm trying to eliminate as many shoulds from my life as possible. One the enemy of peace of mind is expectations drilled into you by society and other people. Socially, we're told, go work out. Go look good. That's a multiplayer competitive game. Other people can see if I'm doing a good job or not. We're told, go make money. Go buy a big house. Again, external multiplayer competitive game. Training yourself to be happy is completely internal. There is no external progress, no external validation. You're competing against yourself it is a single player game. We're like bees or ants. We are such social creatures, we're externally programmed and driven. We don't know how to play and win these single player games anymore. We compete purely in multiplayer games. The reality is life is a single player game. You're born alone. You're going to die alone. All of your interpretations are alone. All your memories are alone. You're gone in three generations, and nobody cares. Before you showed up, nobody cared. It's all single player. Perhaps one reason why yoga and meditation are hard to sustain is they have no extrinsic value. Purely single player games. Buffett has a great example when he asks if you want to be the world's best lover and known as the worst, or the world's worst lover and known as the best. Paraphrased in reference to an inner or external scorecard. Exactly right. 
All the real scorecards are internal. Jealousy was a very hard emotion for me to overcome. When I was young, I had a lot of jealousy. By and by, I learned to get rid of it. It still crops up every now and then. It's such a poisonous emotion because, at the end of the day, you're no better off with jealousy. You're unhappier, and the person you're jealous of is still successful or good looking or whatever they are. One day, I realized with all these people I was jealous of, I couldn't just choose little aspects of their life. I couldn't say I want his body, I want her money, I want his personality. You have to be that person. Do you want to actually be that person with all of their reactions, their desires, their family, their happiness level, their outlook on life, their self-image? If you're not willing to do a wholesale, 24-7, 100% swap with who that person is, then there is no point in being jealous. Once I came to that realization, jealousy faded away because I don't want to be anybody else. I'm perfectly happy being me. By the way, even that is under my control. To be happy being me. It's just there are no social rewards for it. For happiness is built by habits my most surprising discovery in the last five years is that peace and happiness are skills. These are not things you are born with. Yes, there is a genetic range. And a lot of it is conditioning from your environment, but you can uncondition and recondition yourself. You can increase your happiness over time, and it starts with believing you can do it. It's a skill. Just like nutrition is a skill, dieting is a skill, working out is a skill, making money is a skill, meeting girls and guys is a skill, having good relationships is a skill, even love is a skill. It starts with realizing there. Skills you can learn. When you put your intention and focus on it, the world can become a better place. When working, surround yourself with people more successful than you. When playing, surround yourself with people happier than you. What type of skill is happiness? It's all trial and error. You just see what works. You can try sitting meditation. Did that work for you? Was it Tantra meditation or was it Vipassana meditation? Was it a 10 day retreat or was 20 minutes enough? Okay. None of those worked. But what if I tried yoga? What if I kite surfed? What if I go car racing? What about cooking? Does that make me zen? You literally have to try all of these things until you find something that works for you. When it comes to medicines for the mind, the placebo effect is 100% effective. When it comes to your mind, you want to be positively inclined, not incredulous in belief. If it is fully internal, you should have a positive mindset. For example, I was reading The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, which is a fantastic introduction to being present, for people who are not religious. He shows you the single most important thing is to be present and hammers it home over and over again until you get it. He wrote about this body energy exercise. You lie down and you feel the energy moving around your body. At that point, the old me would have put the book down and said, well, that's BS. But the new me said, well, if I believe it, maybe it'll work. I went into it with a positive mindset. I laid down and tried the meditation. You know what? It felt really good. How does someone build the skill of happiness? You can build good habits. Not drinking alcohol will keep your mood more stable. Not eating sugar will keep your mood more stable. Not going on Facebook, Snapchat, or Twitter will keep your mood more stable. Playing video games will make you happier in the short run and I used to be an avid gamer but in the long run, it could ruin your happiness. You're being fed dopamine and having dopamine withdrawn from you in these little uncontrollable ways. Caffeine is another one where you trade long term for the short term. Essentially, you have to go through your life replacing your thoughtless bad habits with good ones, making a commitment to be a happier person. At the end of the day, you are a combination of your habits and the people who you spend the most time with. When we're kids, we have very few habits. 
Over time, we learn the things we are not supposed to do. We become self-conscious. We start forming habits and routines. Many distinctions between people who get happier as they get older and people who don't can be explained by what habits they have developed. Are they habits that will increase your long-term happiness rather than your short-term happiness? Are you surrounding yourself with people who are generally positive and upbeat people? Are those relationships low maintenance? Do you admire and respect but not envy them? There's the five chimps theory where you can predict a chimps behavior by the five chimps it hangs out with the most. I think that applies to humans as well. Maybe it's politically incorrect to say you should choose your friends very wisely. But you shouldn't choose them haphazardly based on who you live next to or who you happen to work with. The people who are the most happy and optimistic choose the right five chimps. Eight, the first rule of handling conflict is, don't hang around people who constantly engage in conflict. I'm not interested in anything unsustainable or even hard to sustain, including difficult relationships. Five, if you can't see yourself working with someone for life, don't work with them for a day. There's a friend of mine, a Persian guy named Behazid. He just loves life, and he has no time for anybody who is not happy. If you ask Behazid what's his secret, he'll just look up and say, stop asking why and start saying wow. The world is such an amazing place. As humans, we're used to taking everything for granted. Like what you and I are doing right now. We're sitting indoors, wearing clothes, well-fed, and communicating with each other through space and time. We should be two monkeys sitting in the jungle right now watching the sun going down, asking ourselves where we are going to sleep. When we get something, we assume the world owes it to us. If you're present, you'll realize how many gifts and how much abundance there is around us at all times. That's all you really need to do. I'm here now, and I have all these incredible things at my disposal. Eight, the most important trick to being happy is to realize happiness is a skill you develop and a choice you make. You choose to be happy, and then you work at it. It's just like building muscles. It's just like losing weight. It's just like succeeding at your job. It's just like learning calculus. You decide it's important to you. You prioritize it above everything else. You read everything on the topic. 7 Happiness Habits I have a series of tricks I use to try and be happier in the moment. At first, they were silly and difficult and required a lot of attention, but now some of them have become second nature. By doing them religiously, I've managed to increase my happiness level quite a bit. The obvious one is meditation inside meditation. Working toward a specific purpose on it, which is to try and understand how my mind works. 7. Just being very aware in every moment. If I catch myself judging somebody, I can stop myself and say, what's the positive interpretation of this? I used to get annoyed about things. Now I always look for the positive side of it. It used to take a rational effort. It used to take a few seconds for me to come up with a positive. Now I can do it sub-second. 7. I try to get more sunlight on my skin. I look up and smile. 7. Every time you catch yourself desiring something, say, is it so important to me I'll be unhappy unless this goes my way. You're going to find with the vast majority of things it's just not true. 7. I think dropping caffeine made me happier. It makes me more of a stable person. 7. I think working out every day made me happier. If you have peace of body, it's easier to have peace of mind. 7. The more you judge, the more you separate yourself. You'll feel good for an instant, because you feel good about yourself, thinking you're better than someone. Later, you're going to feel lonely. Then, you see negativity everywhere. The world just reflects your own feelings back at you. 77. Tell your friends you're a happy person. Then, you'll be forced to conform to it. You'll have a consistency bias. You have to live up to it. Your friends will expect you to be a happy person. 5. Recover time and happiness by minimizing your use of these three smartphone apps, 
phone, calendar, and alarm clock. 11. The more secrets you have, the less happy you're going to be. 11. Caught in a funk? Use meditation, music, and exercise to reset your mood. Then choose a new path to commit emotional energy for rest of day. 11. Hedonic adaptation is more powerful for man-made things, cars, houses, clothes, money, than for natural things, food, sex, exercise. 11. No exceptions all screen activities linked to less happiness, all non-screen activities linked to more happiness. 11. A personal metric, how much of the day is spent doing things out of obligation rather than out of interest. 11. It's the news job to make you anxious and angry. But it's underlying scientific, economic, education, and conflict trends are positive. Stay optimistic. 11. Politics, academia, and social status are all zero-sum games. Positive-sum games create positive people. 11. Increase serotonin in the brain without drugs, sunlight, exercise, positive thinking, and tryptophan. 11. Changing habits, pick one thing. Cultivate a desire. Visualize it. Plan a sustainable path. Identify needs, triggers, and substitutes. Tell your friends. Track meticulously. Self-discipline is a bridge to a new self-image. Bake in the new self-image. It's who you are now. 11. First, you know it. Then, you understand it. Then, you can explain it. Then, you can feel it. Finally, you are it. Find happiness in acceptance. In any situation in life, you always have three choices, you can change it, you can accept it, or you can leave it. If you want to change it, then it is a desire. It will cause you suffering until you successfully change it. So don't pick too many of those. Pick one big desire in your life at any given time to give yourself purpose and motivation. Why not two? You will be distracted. Even one is hard enough. Being peaceful comes from having your mind clear of thoughts. And a lot of clarity comes from being in the present moment. It's very hard to be in the present moment if you're thinking, I need to do this. I want that. This has got to change. 8. You always have three options, you can change it, you can accept it, or you can leave it. What is not a good option is to sit around wishing you would change it but not changing it, wishing you could leave it but not leaving it and not accepting it. That struggle or aversion is responsible for most of our misery. The phrase I probably use the most to myself in my head is just one word, accept. 5. What does acceptance look like to you? It's to be okay whatever the outcome is. It's to be balanced and centered. It's to step back and to see the grander scheme of things. We don't always get what we want, but sometimes what is happening is for the best. The sooner you can accept it as a reality, the sooner you can adapt to it. Achieving acceptance is very difficult. I have a couple of hacks I try, but I wouldn't say they are totally successful. One hack is stepping back and looking at previous bits of suffering I've had in my life. I write them down. Last time you broke up with somebody, last. Time you had a business failure, last time you had a health issue, what happened? I can trace the growth and improvement that came from it years later. I have another hack I use for minor annoyances. When they happen, a part of me will instantly react negatively. But I've learned to mentally ask myself, what is the positive of this situation? Okay, I'll be late for a meeting. But what is the benefit to me? I get to relax and watch the birds for a moment. I'll also spend less time in that boring meeting. There's almost always something positive. Even if you can't come up with something positive, you can say, well, the universe is going to teach me something now. Now I get to listen and learn. To give you the simplest example, I was at an event and afterward, someone flooded my inbox with a whole bunch of photos they took. There was a tiny instant judgment saying, come on, couldn't you have just selected a few of the best? Who sends a hundred photos? 
But then immediately I asked myself, what is the positive? The positive is that I get to pick my five favorite photos. I get to use my judgment. Over the last year, by practicing this hack enough, I've managed to go from taking a couple of seconds to think of a response, to now my brain doing it almost instantaneously. That's a habit you can train yourself to do. 8. How do you learn to accept things you can't change? Fundamentally, it boils down to one big hack, embracing death. Death is the most important thing that is ever going to happen to you. When you look at your death and you acknowledge it, rather than running away from it, it'll bring great meaning to your life. We spend so much of our life trying to avoid death. So much of what we struggle for can be classified as a quest for immortality. If you're religious and believe there is an afterlife, then you'll be taken care of. If you're not religious, maybe you'll have kids. If you're an artist, a painter, or a businessman, you want to leave a legacy behind. Here's a hot tip, there is no legacy. There's nothing to leave. We're all going to be gone. Our children will be gone. Our works will be dust. Our civilizations will be dust. Our planet will be dust. Our solar system will be dust. In the grand scheme of things, the universe has been around for 10 billion years. It'll be around for another 10 billion years. Your life is a firefly blink in a night. You're here for such a brief period of time. If you fully acknowledge the futility of what you're doing, then I think it can bring great happiness and peace because you realize this is a game. But it's a fun game. All that matters is you experience your reality as you go through life. Why not interpret it in the most positive possible way? Any moment where you're not having a great time, when you're not really happy, you're not doing anyone any favors. It's not like your unhappiness makes them better off somehow. All you're doing is wasting this incredibly small and precious time you have on this earth. Keeping death on the forefront and not denying it is very important. Whenever I get caught up in my ego battles, I just think of entire civilizations that have come and gone. For example, take the Sumerians. I'm sure they were important people and did great things, but go ahead and name me a single Sumerian. Tell me anything interesting or important Sumerians did that lasted? Nothing. So maybe 10,000 years from now or 100,000 years from now, people will say, oh yeah, Americans. I've heard of Americans. Eight, you're going to die one day, and none of this is going to matter. So enjoy yourself. Do something positive. Project some love. Make someone happy. Laugh a little bit. Appreciate the moment. And do your work. Eight.